if you hadn't already discovered in the last hour or so, there is a bit happening on the economy and household budgets today. So let's check in now with today's political panel and Labor MP Sally Situ joins us in the studio. Welcome back, Sally. And Liberal Senator Holly Hughes is in Sydney. Welcome, Holly. If you can indulge us, first of all, we might just do a little bit of a uh, situation report with Sally as a newly elected MP. Uh, Parliament's still a while off. What brings you to Canberra? You're being schooled up on uh, how to operate in this place? Yes, well, we've got rookie school for all the in class, um, incoming 2022 class for the Labor Party, and there's a big group of us, which is exciting. Learning all the ropes, what about uh, a procedure and how the caucus works? Procedure but also um, how to make sure that we're within our entitlements and that we're not breaching any rules in any way because we want to start on the right foot. Integrity in Parliament is one of the, the key pillars that um, we are pushing as a government and we need to do that as individuals as well. Very sound advice. I reckon you'd agree with that wouldn't you Holly Hughes? Uh, you're probably thinking back to your own time when all of that was drummed into you. Good afternoon, Greg, and welcome to Canberra, Sally. Uh, Thank you. It's a good time of year to start Canberra with uh, the winter well and truly underway. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I do remember my Senate school, and uh, it's, it's really lovely because you do actually get an opportunity to meet all new incoming senators uh, from across across the chamber um, and it's it's quite a bonding experience to have your year group uh, together. Yeah there'll be a bit of that still to come I think for yeah. the broader group that goes beyond the Labor caucus. Sally why don't we start with you on these issues of the day for an incoming government and Treasurer Jim Chalmers but but all of you within the Labor government it's pretty obvious you're going to have to be the recipients and or deliverers of uh, some bitter medicine when it comes to the economy over the months ahead, aren't you? That's unfortunate. Absolutely. And I, I don't envy um, Jim Chalmers and Chris Bowen's um, situation. Uh, there's no doubt that um, there are families, particularly in the electorate that I represent, who are going to really feel the increasing prices that are coming up. So we know electricity is going up, petrol prices are going up, interest rates are going up, we found out today. The only thing that isn't going up is wages and that has got to change. And it probably will, won't it, based on at least the last uh, set of inflation numbers which were plugged in to the government's submission to the minimum wage case. But is that even enough? I mean, they pointed to, Tony Burke pointed to 5.1%, which was the inflation rate, but that's not likely to be for very much longer, isn't it? It's going up from here. Well, we know that um, inflation is likely to be trending up and we've seen that interest rates are probably going to track a similar course. And there are going to be some families, um, for example, me, sure. I've never experienced an interest rate increase in the mortgage that I have. So this will come as a shock for many. Um, but what we need to do, and something that the Coalition failed to do, is we need to have long-term measures in place that are going to ease the cost of living for families. For example, making childcare more affordable. And the Coalition have always treated these policies as short-term romantic flings. They have just put things in as sweeteners to win them an election, but not really to help families and ease the cost of living for them. All right, well, that invites a response from Holly. Why don't we do that just mm. now, Holly? Um, I mean, investment in productive uh, initiatives like childcare subsidies uh, do deliver a advantages on cost of living for families, don't they, at least in the medium term? Uh, you'd give Labor credit for that? Well, what I can give credit to is Alan Tudge and the childcare rebates that he introduced that were particularly effective for those families with more than one child in childcare. I do notice, though, we talk a lot about childcare. There's a lot of families who are past childcare impacting their family budget. It's actually things like school fees and the Labor's new proposed model where they want to reduce funding for private schools will force families to remove their children from private schools and that's what they're starting to say because that is going to increase further cost of living pressures on families who've opted for a private school system and, and let's remember we're not all talking top tier private schools here. Some of them are low fee Catholic schools etc but they are all saying they'll be impacted with a new proposal by Labor so that's going to be a further 
uh, but is that a matter? Is that a matter of personal buses? personal choice for those? Well, families? it is a matter of health, personal choice. But I can tell you, every public school in the states couldn't handle a whole exodus of kids out of private schools, and it'll also put pressure on family budgets. But I think more importantly is what's happening in energy prices, and it's very interesting to have a look at what the domestic gas price was before the election and then straight after the election. There was a very significant jump because of the relationship that Minister Taylor had with the gas companies. We've now got an energy minister in Chris Bowen who has publicly said that investment in gas is a fraud. We had members such as Jed Carney saying that we should ban the barbecue during the election campaign. There has been nothing but negativity around uh, looking at the gas market, developing of gas markets, uh, ensuring that gas plants were being built. There was zero support from the Labor Party when it came to the Curry Curry gas plant. Right. Uh, I was there. I was there for the announcement and know what their responses were. So it's, it's got to be more complex than, than those personal relationships, though, doesn't it? Because if uh, your side had more actively encouraged through energy plans uh, renewal and, and investment in generation, then we mm. may not be as reliant as we are on, on coal and gas right now? Well, I, look, there is no technology at all in the world anywhere that is going to provi provide reliable, affordable, base load power through renewables. It's just not there when it comes to the technology. There is technology moving forward when it comes to things like lithium-ion batteries that will allow storage from things such as solar because solar panels don't work at night without the storage. So mm. we do need to be mindful that the technology needs to catch up and that's happening. And certainly from our point of view, we've always been focused on allowing the technology to catch up but also allowing it to occur in a way that can be market driven. And if you talk to people in renewables, they tend to be very focused on their corner of the market, whether it's solar, wind, sure. hydrogen. Uh, so you've still got disparity between the different types of energies uh, and how effective they're going to be going forward. Mm. We are going to be reliant on coal. We are going to be reliant on gas. It's very interesting to see Madeleine King today talking about the need for coal-fired power stations to upgrade. Some of the problems we've got is through the rhetoric that we've seen and the almost woke agendas being pushed by some of the banking sector and finance sector banning investment in coal-fired power stations. Well, how are these companies going to invest more to improve their facilities, to ensure that they're not having outages, to make sure that yeah. the maintenance is up to speed if the finance mechanisms have been turned off? We need to have a serious discussion and, re and review. We have some of the best resources in the world. It used to be our advantage. We need to make sure that we're taking full advantage of that. And that doesn't mean Ed Cusick, who's now responsible for manufacturing, heading off to Indonesia at a time when manufacturers, and particularly modern manufacturers, are under the pump, under energy costs and particularly gas costs. All right. I imagine he would uh, have a defence for that. As we turn to Sally Situ, I imagine Ed Husick would say that he could have and did uh, make certain approaches to industrial players before he left for a relatively short visit to Indonesia of a couple of days. But just on Holly's point, Sally, about uh, you know what she calls this sort of woke uh, investment agenda of financiers um, not wanting to back coal or gas, is that true? And if so, are those chickens coming home to roost now? Well, it is an interesting perspective from Senator Hughes that she's calling action on climate change a woke agenda. And I think that really goes to the heart of um, how the coalition see our energy policy as a whole, but also action on climate change. And we need to be very clear, they had nine years to develop a energy policy. We have been in government for two weeks. Um, Angus Taylor has had more tries at developing an energy policy than the NRL season has had tries. <laughs> and the fact that he has been unable to give the industry certainty, um, predictability and reliability. So this is a perfect storm. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's been a storm that has been a long time brewing and the coalition have failed to act. They've failed to really implement a plan that will drive down electricity prices. Sure. Whereas we have a plan that has been independently modelled to show that it will drive down electricity prices, but it will also help us meet 
our emissions reduction targets. Yeah, I, th I think there was a phrase John Howard used to use, you know, being mugged by reality. Was it striking to your ears, as, as Holly Hughes pointed out there, that Madeleine King was kind of jawboning coal-fired generators into getting those coal-fired plants cracking again today? Is there a sense in which she or others in your government may have been mugged by reality, that that is where we find ourselves having to dial up coal and gas fired generators to meet immediate need before we get to renewables and, you know, rebuilding all of that. I mean, there's no doubt that the energy mix that we have at the moment is a complex jigsaw puzzle of which coal fired um, generator power plants are one part of that, as is gas, as is renewables. Mm. What we want to make sure of is that those jigsaw pieces are fitting together and it's important that we use every part of that. So all of those energy um, components are an important part of that mix. Yeah, you sound like you would probably agree with that, Holly, uh, in that, you know, at least in the transition period, there's a place for kind of all of the above until the picture becomes clearer. But, but on this path to cutting emissions, what's so magical for an opposition coalition about a number like 28% reduction by 2030. Why are you going to sort of stand and fight on that hill in this next parliament, given the mandate or the vote of the people on the 21st of May? Well, there's a couple of points there, Greg. The first one is if we want to consider 32% of the primary vote a mandate, we might need to have to review what a mandate looks like, uh, which is what the Labor Party got at the last federal election. So. Uh, that's the first thing, 68% of people voted for somebody else. Uh, but when you look at, uh, you know, the 26 to 28 that we took to the election, we are, as you point out, the opposition now. The Labor Party has a target of 43%. And I, I, no criticism of Sally, she wasn't in the party room at that point in time. Uh, but the Labor Party uh, caucus had a meeting. Uh, the left wanted 46, the right wanted 40, so they settled on 43. Yep, science. So uh, it's actually up to the Labor Party as the government now to provide details. Uh, Albanese was very clear, Mr Albanese was very clear during the election, he's going to be a leader who leads, he's going to take responsibility, uh, he was going to hold a hose. Well, he hasn't been here to do very much since the energy crisis started mm. uh, and it was his own words that he was going to be here to lead and take responsibility. Well, it's up to him to take responsibility, show the detail of why 43% is somehow based in science, is somehow not going to destroy our economy and is going to provide not only a benefit to, us, to Australia, but a global benefit. Because well, right, this, well, action, this your action argument. is driven by you know, global action. And when you've got countries that are out there building more power plants, coal-fired power plants per week than we, we have, then you know, we're not playing on a level playing field. Yeah, but accepting your argument, even if there was something politically arbitrary about settling on a number of 43%, and even if they didn't uh, reach that or make good progress towards that, uh, the question still comes back politically to a defeated coalition. Uh, why, why stick rigidly? You could almost get away with not having a target for a period of time and then resetting towards the end of this parliament, couldn't you? Well, look, I've been in this job for about 48 hours, I think, now, Greg. So we haven't all got together in Canberra to have a discussion going forward, and those sort of policies will be developed as we move forward over the next couple of years. So uh, I'm not going to preempt where we're going to land on that. But I am concerned about the difference between setting a target and legislating. It is incredibly important in my view that we leave the technology to be developed by scientists and that we don't bring in instruments that are then managed by bureaucrats and politicians that will move us towards a carbon tax. It should be based on technology. I think the technology is in the works. If you look at what is even happening around nuclear small modular, there are huge technological advances happening around the world uh, that are having a great impact on how we are able to better use renewables, how they are able to produce and provide more stable and reliable energy, but we're not there yet. Yeah. And we want to make sure that those decisions are being made or the, the work's being done and driven by both the market and scientists not being dictated by bureaucrats. All right. Uh, well, Sally, I'll, I'll get you a, a quick reply on that. Uh, legislating or not legislating your targets, what, what is the need to lock that into law at 
43%. Would it matter if you didn't? Chris Bowen can still be moving his baselines and mechanisms up and down, can't he? Uh, regulating emissions with or without legislation, to Holly's point? Yeah, well, two things that I want to say. And it's interesting um, that Senator Hughes raises the idea of details because absolutely we should have detail when it comes to these policies. Something which the coalition never provided us about their climate change policy. Mm -hmm. We got a pamphlet instead. And what we have said is we've got detailed modelling that shows our policies will get us not only cheaper energy, but more jobs in the region, as well as a reduction of 43% in our emissions. And that is the detail that we have provided throughout the campaign, and people have been able to see that and has been independently modelled. So it's interesting that she raises that. But I, I think um, what we've also seen is that we have a clear pathway to getting to that 43% reduction. How we, how we get there, whether it's legislated or not, I think is um, beside the point. What we do have is a clear plan to get us there. All right. Well, look, we were going to get some uh, late ref reflections from both of you on uh, the Prime Minister's trip to Indonesia, but I think he's soon to board the plane and take off, so we might be overrun by events there. And in that case, uh, Holly Hughes, I think we might thank you and farewell you. Uh, great appreciation for stepping up to the plate late in the piece for us today. Uh, we'll talk to you again before too long. And Sally Situ joining us here in the studio, Labor member for Reid. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, us here today. Thank you.